Hi, everyone. Welcome to Undressing the Issue with me, Julia. I am a Los Angeles-based therapist, and I specialize in working with all sorts of different issues revolving around sex and sexuality. So today, what I want to talk about is kind of an interesting topic. Um, Basically, the difference between rescuing and resentment. (laughs) I know, it sounds kind of related, kind of not, but I'll get into it. So the reason why I want to talk about this is because I see it so much, not only in couples therapy, but also in working with individuals who are in relationships. So this doesn't have to be marriage. It could be any kind of relationship, but I mostly see it in longer term relationships or among people who are already living with their partners cohabitating, if you will. So basically, here is why I bring this up. I hear this a lot. I'll give you an example of a client that I work with. So this client came to see me, uh, I want to say at least a couple of years ago. Um, She's been working with me ever since. And basically, her issue is that She felt like she was doing way too much for her husband, like she's raising him as if he's a child. She's playing the role of mom. It's all about him. It's the him show. And she was really resentful of how much she was doing, meaning basically, well, not meaning. I'll just explain that. How about that? So basically, he was very, very anxious And he had a lot of anxiety about different things, uh, things that most people don't have anxiety towards, but he did. Um, One of the things he was really anxious about is going into big stores like Target or a grocery store and having, you know, having himself be in this big building with no windows. It's like a giant box with all these aisles and lots of people. Remember, I'm in L.A., So we're densely populated. Everything's crowded. Parking's impossible. There's lines everywhere. So basically, this would um, elicit a ton of anxiety from him, having to go to these places and deal with the logistics and deal with the people and deal with all of it. So she found herself running all of the errands for the household, um, doing all of these different things for him because he was anxious and he was also really unorganized. So he would remember that he needed things like last minute. And then all of a sudden it's like the day before he needs something, he doesn't have it. And he comes to her frantically and goes, Oh my God, Oh my God, I need, I need to go get travel size, you know, products. Cause I'm going on a trip and I totally forgot. And I'm leaving early tomorrow morning. Will you go get it for me? And of course she would do it. So, We started talking about this and kind of um, unpacking it or undressing it, if you will. And the thing that stood out to me is that she's saying, yes. She keeps saying, yeah, I'll go get it. Sure, fine. Even when she doesn't want to. So now, years later, we've set a precedent Now he's accustomed to being able to ask for this and for her to say yes, regardless of how resentful she gets. And she would get mad at him. Why don't you ever do this? Well, why should he if you're doing it for him? Duh. So basically, I started talking to her about, well, why are you playing the rescuer? Why are you playing this role of mom if you don't want to? Why are you saying yes to things that are actually big fat no's for you. It's a no. If it's a no, why say yes? So I started working with her on practicing saying what she actually means. So this started off slowly. Initially, it was really hard for her. She still found herself stumbling and fumbling, and she found herself doing things and not noticing herself saying yes to stuff. These are old patterns, so they're going to be hard to break. And so slowly but surely, she started setting better boundaries and she started saying no. 
So this is a simple example, right? Over time, her husband learned to move through his anxiety. He learned that he has to keep himself a little bit more organized. He's got to plan ahead that his lack of planning shouldn't become an emergency for her. It's his lack of planning. That's his emergency. So I see this in so many different ways. This is a very basic example. But I find that oftentimes, because we get scared of letting the other person down or making them feel unloved or because we're afraid to ask, because we're afraid to hear no, we don't speak our truth. We're not honest about what we're really feeling, needing, or not wanting to do. So this comes in many different forms. This can come in the form of having sex when we don't really want to, and then feeling bad about it later, feeling like, Ugh, why did I do that? This comes in the form of agreeing to different relationship dynamics that we're not really down with. Let's say opening up a relationship because our partner asks and we say okay because we don't want to lose this person, but at the same time, we're not okay with it. It comes in so many different forms, even in something as simple as I really don't feel like you're hearing me or you're able to uh, be there for me right now, be present, and I need that from you. So if you can't give that to me, let me know when you can. And instead, we feel rejected. We get into different types of arguments and fights, and we build resentment. So why do we do this? Why does this happen? Well, first of all, I do, I don't like to generalize, but I'm going to in this case because I think it's valid. But I want to take a look at how, for example, cisgendered women are raised and socialized in this country. At least people my age, which is, you know, getting up there in years, but if you're in your mid to late 30s or older, you probably grew up with things like Barbies. Cabbage Patch Kids, you grew up with, uh, do you remember Trolls, Troll Dolls, those are fun, but you grew up with things that kind of represented babies, and you had to clothe them, take care of them. Um, we were socialized to be nurturers, that this is what is normal for girls, this is what girls are supposed to do. This is the type of play that girls are supposed to engage in. So women are often socialized to be nurturers. And what that means in relationships is that they're going to put someone else's needs before their own. And then they're going to feel depleted or they're going to feel like their needs are not being met. And that's when resentment comes in. And resentment is one of the deadly horsemen of relationships. So how do we break these habits? How do we find ourselves doing this? How do we gain awareness even? Because this is a hard thing to become aware of because oftentimes we justify it to ourselves. Like, oh, well, I'm just, I'm being a good partner. I'm being, you know, caring. I'm being... Um, I'm being giving and generous. I'm trying to be there for my other person. And that's what this is. So that is going to require compromise. And, you know, it's going to require kindness. All of those things are great. And absolutely, you need that in relationships, you need to have a certain level of compromise, willingness, generosity, caring. Absolutely. But at what point is that no longer just kindness and generosity and it becomes just overtaxing or feeling like you're being demanded of. Demanded of? Demanding from? Demand? I don't know. Whatever. You know what I'm saying. So I think that the determining factor in this is that you have to consider when you're saying yes, are you saying yes because you actually want to? 
Do you have a desire, a sense of wanting to do something for the other person? Or are you saying yes because you feel obligated? Is it coming out of obligation or is it coming out of your own free will, your power of self-determination, and your decision to do something kind for the other? If it's an obligation, and if you find yourself doing this on a regular basis where you're constantly saying yes to things and you feel like you're always the one giving and you're rarely getting in return, this is going to be a problem. And this is when you're trying to be a rescuer. So a rescuer sounds like it's kind of noble, but at the same time, it's disempowering for the person that you're rescuing. You're not actually helping them to be more autonomous and to be more independent and to learn certain skills that they may need. You're also not creating a dynamic in your relationship that is reciprocal. It's not equal. There's, it's not give and take. It's one person always giving, the other person always taking. And when there is this imbalance and when it remains that way, this is really damaging and toxic for relationships. It's not good. One person should not be the only one always giving. And, you know, I often hear from my clients, I'm, I'm a giver, right? I, it's like a it's like a thing that they say with pride. I'm a giver. I'm generous. I'm caring. I'm such a great partner. Well, here's the thing. I disagree. I call bullshit. If you're always the one giving, you're not actually practicing communicating your own needs. You're not actually implementing and maintaining healthy boundaries, which are necessary for any and every relationship. And I'm sure I'll be talking a whole hell of a lot about boundaries because that's such a huge thing in relationships. But you're creating a precedent. You're creating a pattern. And it's one that you didn't even want in the first place. And when you're always giving, you're never actually in a an authentic, genuine place. It's not who you are. It's not what you actually want. So in reality, you're a taker because you're taking of yourself. You're taking from yourself. You're taking from the opportunities to have your own needs met if you're always, always, always giving. So this works both ways. For those that are takers, for those that are always taking and taking and taking from another person, they're also giving themselves away. I mean, they're not, um, they're not doing anything that is making them feel really, really genuinely good about themselves. They're always just kind of feeding off of others. So, it kind of works in reverse. I know this is kind of abstract. It seems kind of uh, confusing, but I do think it's necessary to talk about this because we get lost in this. We get lost in this in relationships. A lot of relationships are affected by this where one person feels like they're contributing more than the other or like they're getting the short end of the stick or you know, the other person has it so good and they don't appreciate me. Well, what is it that you think they have that's so good? And in what ways do you feel like you don't have it? And have you asked for it? That's important. If you're not asking for what you need, if you're not communicating clearly about what it is you're looking for from the other person to feel cared for, loved, seen, all of those kinds of things that we need in partnership, then how do you expect them to do it for you? And if you're also not saying no to the things that you don't feel comfortable doing or that you are make you feel unsafe with them or you feel like that's too much to ask, if you don't say no in those instances, how are they to know that you feel that way? We are not, we're not, 
supposed to expect our partners I'm trying to put my words together can you tell I haven't had enough coffee um we're not supposed to expect our partners to be mind readers we're not psychics our partners are not psychic we're not we're not supposed to just put the thought into our own minds and expect them to be alerted to the thought being there it doesn't work that way people don't think that way so You've got to communicate. That's what it boils down to. And you, I mean, for a lot of people, that means moving past your own fear of how they're going to receive what you have to say, how they're going to respond to what you have to say, and whether or not they're actually going to show up for us. Meaning when we make a request, what we're doing basically is we're asking for something which means the other person can say either yes or no. And you have to be prepared for either answer. So if the person says no, what does that mean for you? Does that mean it's okay, you'll do it yourself? It's not a big deal. You can understand why they're saying no. Or is it a deal breaker? Is it something that you absolutely need for them? It is make it or break it, do or die. And that is unacceptable. And if that is the answer, are you prepared to act on that? That's kind of a heavy question because I've had so many people tell me, you know, I really want to ask and it is a deal breaker, but the problem is I'm not ready to move forward with the consequence of it being a no. I, I'm not ready to actually, you know, do that. Okay, well, there's a difference between wanting your partner to know that you have the question versus actually asking it. So sometimes you just need to tell your partner that you have the question, but you don't really want to hear their answer. But nobody considers this as an option in communicating with their partners. They think, well, either I have it or I don't. Well, not necessarily. How well do you want your partner to know you? Do you want them to be privy to what's going on in your mind, what you're thinking about, what's coming up for you? Or is this strictly, uh, you know, we, we only discuss things when they're absolutely urgent. I call that the fire drill mentality, where I don't know if you've, well, I'm sure you probably have, if you've been raised in the US, in middle school, high school, you have fire drills, right? They have the fire department come over, they sound the alarm, somebody has a really nice neon vest and they're the leader of the pack and they're the ones who are supposed to help everybody line up and evacuate to the designated location outside of the building. And so we practice this so that when there is a fire, it's not pandemonium. Everybody knows what to do. There's a plan in place. It's not everybody running screaming from the building. This is the same idea. You can't practice the drill in the middle of the fire. You've got to practice it ahead of time. So when something comes up in your relationship that's kind of a crisis or it's urgent or you need to have it addressed right away, if you and your partner haven't practiced communicating, sharing feelings, hearing one another, helping the other feel like they've been heard, when shit hits the fan and you have to address something, it may not go over well. It may lead to a big blowout fight, but you haven't practiced it. So what do you expect? Practice makes perfect. Well, not perfect. We're not looking for perfection. Let's be honest. Progress, not perfection. So the moral of the story is communication, being honest and authentic, speaking your truth, saying no when you mean no, and saying yes when you mean yes. And having the type of rapport with your partner where they're accustomed to this, where this is not anything new, where this has been how it's been from the beginning. But even if it hasn't, you can still shift the dynamics if they're not working for you. I, this may be a totally novel idea for some of you. What? You can shift dynamics? You could change the dynamics in a relationship after it's already gone on for a long time? Yes. Yes, you can. Absolutely. Hell yes. You can. It's just about communication, negotiation. Hey, you know what? For a long time, I've been doing all the grocery shopping for our household, and 
I really hate it. I really hate it. It really bothers me that it's always falling on me. It's it's an errand that I absolutely loathe and despise. I hate going and you are sometimes unhappy with the things that I buy and you want something different or you ask me to buy something different so you can try something and I don't know what you want to try. So how would it be for you to maybe every once in a while do the grocery shopping instead of me and then you can get whatever you want and then I won't get anything wrong and it'll also take some of that load off of me because it absolutely drives me nuts. And so we start a shift. It's that simple. Well, <laughs> it sounds simple, but it can be a little more complicated with deeper issues. So for example, I work with sex addicts, right? Sex, love addicts, pornography addicts. And oftentimes I get asked the question, should I have sex with my partner, the partner who has the addiction, just because I don't want them to relapse? Should I give in even when it doesn't feel comfortable or safe for me because it feels even more unsafe for me to, to, to say no and worry that they're going to act out again or they're going to relapse again or whatever else? Well, this is what I tell those people. It is not your job to keep the addict sober. It is not your job to give them access to your body when you're not comfortable doing so out of fear that they are going to relapse. That is not your job. It is not your responsibility. Your job is to be honest about your needs, your sense of safety, and their job in their recovery process is to be able to manage all of their feelings about it to help rebuild the trust that was broken in your relationship and show up for you, help you feel safe. So whether you have sex with this person or not, they may still relapse. And if you are to say yes to that when you don't feel comfortable saying yes to that, and they relapse anyway, how is that going to feel for you? Are you then going to feel like, well, why did I do that? It didn't feel good for me. I didn't want to do that. That sucks. And if that's not going to keep them sober, then ugh, what the hell will? Well, they are the ones who have to keep them sober, not you. Not you. It's not your job. It's not your responsibility. You didn't cause this addiction. You didn't contribute to this addiction. It's not your fault. You were not involved in this in any way. And more likely than not, they had this problem long before you came into the picture. So slow your roll, back it up, and take care of you. That is your main job if you are the betrayed partner in that relationship. So again, we're not trying to rescue the other we're not trying to do things for them that are their responsibility. We're not trying to pull their emotional weight in the relationship if they're not pulling it. And if that also feels icky to us. If that's the case, we have to get comfortable with no. No is not, I don't love you. No is not, I don't care what you need, what you want. No is simply, I don't feel comfortable with that. I'm happy to share my reasons if you would like to hear them. And maybe there's something else that we can agree upon that I could do that I feel comfortable doing. But this particular thing is not comfortable. So I'm going to say no. I hope this makes sense. It's a tough one because... Oftentimes, we associate no with rejection or even abandonment, depending on what we're saying no to. But at what point do we draw the line between it being rejection or abandonment versus it being self-care? 
we're not trying to do things that are going to make us resentful. We're not trying to do things that feel unsafe. We want to do things that feel safe and that are going to be conducive to the closeness in our relationship. But we're also not going to go against our own needs. And this has to be really clear for both parties in pretty much every aspect of a relationship, whether it's stupid stuff around the house, like grocery shopping, or it's around sex, or it's around communication with other people outside the relationship, we need to be able to communicate about this, be considerate of one another, and be able to implement whatever consequences we need to have in place to feel safe if the other person is not willing to accept our response. It's not a punishment. It's not meant to be punitive. I definitely talk more about this in my boundaries segment, but this is part of that whole mentality of it's not just you or me, it's us, and we need to be cognizant of one another, and we need to be aware of each other's pain points and our comfort levels and our wounds and our traumas and our needs and all of those kinds of things. Good Lord, relationships are complicated. There's so much there. We're not just two people having sex. If only it were that easy, but it's not. And so we have people like me who work with couples and who help them navigate this stuff. And this is an issue that comes up so frequently. So I'm kind of curious in your relationship or maybe in your previous relationships, I would love to hear your stories, your feedback. Have you ever found yourself in a position where you felt like you were doing more for the other person than you were getting in return? Did you ever find yourself saying yes to things that you really meant to say no to? And what got in the way of you saying no when you needed to? What were you afraid of? What felt uncomfortable to you about saying no. I really want to hear your side of it. I would love to hear your feedback. I do think that this is something that is not just exclusive to women. I know men do this quite a bit as well. So it's it's an everybody thing. It's not a gender thing. It's not a culture thing. It's about how we try to placate or people please in relationships to avoid rejection or abandonment. Okay, but then we lose the ability to speak our truth. And that just sucks. So feel free to give me feedback. I would love to hear from you guys. Thanks for listening. And till next time.